Um, well, thanks everybody uh, for, for making the time today. I appreciate you um, having me. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be presenting with you today and kind of share um, a little bit of, of my experience um, in, in the technology retail space. Um, what I'd like to discuss today um, with you and, and really what I'll try to cover um, as best as I can is, um, you know, what, what is a pretty um, well-established but yet emerging trend today in, in the apparel and retail space, which is uh, the phenomenon of, of rental, right? And how um, the rental has really established itself um, in this um, really old school industry that is um, the, the apparel and retail space and, um, and really is ushering kind of a new economy and a new way for people to access um, kind of um, the apparel and retail world. So that's, uh, that's, that's what I'll try to cover today. Um, and in terms of, of, of how I'll, I'll cover this, um, you know, my goal is to basically kind of first give you a little bit of a historical overview of, of, um, of how this, this economy developed, um, giving you a little bit of a deeper dive into how this um, market and how this industry operates, right? Who are the players um, and, and kind of uh, how, how they're shaping this economy. Then go into a bit more of an um, of, um, in-depth business review and, and kind of um, um, deep dive into what, what the actual economy entails, right? What are the benefits uh, both from a consumer perspective and a business perspective um, to kind of ground the conversation. And then I will um, take you through what I believe are kind of the main legal considerations um, for, um, for discussion on, on this topic. Um, and then, you know, obviously more than happy to afterwards um, open it up to Q&A and, and take some questions and answer, um, answer any questions you might have. Um, so, so that's kind of, um, that's kind of um, where we are and, and where I'm thinking um, to take this. So, um, and I assume everything is good. You can see my screen, everything is fine? Everything is fine. Perfect. Great. So kind of a little bit of a background um, on, on the origins of rental, right? Um, actually, apparel rental is a um, not so recent phenomenon, right? And um, rental at large can really be traced to kind of the early, mid 2000s, uh, where you really kind of saw what is not only a rental specific, but really a, a broader e-commerce um, shift right from offline to online and um, through the early to mid 2000s a true shift from people's habits when it came to shopping right people were used to shopping at stores and then um, through the 2000s really the entire experience of shopping you know with the advent of Amazon with the advent of eBay has shifted behaviors completely right from um, from offline to online um, and really a lot of retailers across the spectrum, right from apparel um, all the way through um, everything that you can today buy online, have shifted right the way that they operate in their business models. Um, and people and retailers, and large and small corporations, realized that um, they had to adapt right from this offline environment to an online environment um, to really um, to be able to compete, right, and to really be able to follow. And I think this is really something that's gonna be a bit of a silver lining throughout this presentation, follow the consumer where it's going, right? And really um, try to understand what the consumer wanted. And so really powered by, you know, what I'm sure you, you're familiar with and maybe some of you are part of that generation, you know, what we call Gen Z, right? Which has been, um, unlike any other consumer group before, it's been just willing to experiment and try different things, right? And so starting from kind of the mid 2000s, you see retailers really exploring new business models. And in the United States, really the, the first player that really um, um, in, in a big way entered the rental market was Rent the Runway, which, which some of you might be familiar with, but um, 08, 09 um, really started um, in a way that was um, kind of event oriented, right? Like find that dress to go out. Uh, that you don't need to buy, which is completely re revolutionary, right? Like nobody ever thought that you could kind of go online um, and, and rent a piece of clothing. And really, early, late 2000, which is like, you know, 
now feels like a long time ago, um, that kind of model was, was pioneered. And so I'll come back to, to what that means and where that fits in the scope. But you know, just from a, a, a temporal perspective and a historical perspective, this is really where you see it. Um, also happening in Europe at the same time, uh, but in the United States, which is really kind of my focus and obviously where I have the most experience is kind of when that started. And so, you know, today, when you look at the rental market, right, and really what it means to be a participant as a business in the rental market, um, we see three real ways that um, companies can participate in, in the rental market and can um, really be a player in that ecosystem. Um, one is, you know, some companies, if they're large enough, um, if they believe in the model um, strongly enough, will basically launch this on their own, right? Um, it's what I call kind of fully owned and operated rental subscription service. Um, you know, H&M, which I'm sure um, a lot of you are familiar with, um, Urban Outfitters, which some of you may also be familiar with, um, are today playing in the rental subscription market, uh, both in Europe and in the US, right? But they do it all on their own. Um, they don't use kind of a third party service um, to help them do that. And they only obviously run their own service, right? If you go and, and go on the um, service that Urban Outfitters runs, um, it's only Urban Outfitters that you're able to get, right? And so um, that's really kind of a really end-to-end, -end, fully integrated um, model where you need to be pretty committed, right? As a brand to decide that you're actually gonna run this thing on your own. And that's uh, today a pretty small part of the market, although I think it's probably gonna be a bigger part of the market um, down the line. Um, second is, you know, all these brands that um, basically operate um, through a service provider, right? Or a platform provider. Um, and obviously that's where, you know, the company that used to work for Castle um, is playing, right? Is like this, these companies that are logistical service providers um, and then enable other brands right, to participate in this model without having to run the operations themselves. Um, and that's kind of akin to, um, you know, a wide label service, um, just like you can go um, and, and get somebody to, um, you know, run, run an airline on your behalf, right? You just want your name on the airplane. That's kind of the same concept, right? It's, uh, it's through a service provider that does everything from logistics to shipping. Um, and, and that allows a lot of brands to participate in this economy without having to commit to, for example, building a distribution center, right? Or, or building the infrastructure or really gaining the know-how, which, you know, uh, part of that uh, for, for now, we'll, we'll touch back when we discuss legal considerations. Um, and then finally, the biggest piece of the market today is kind of what I call aggregators, right? Like Rim the Runway, uh, which is probably the leading brand today in the United States when you think about um, um, subscription rental. And these are basically websites where you can go and rent any brand. Right? When you go on Rent the Runway, you don't rent a Rent the Runway dress, right? You want to go and rent, um, you know, I'm going to make this up, but like an, uh, a Giorgio Armani dress, right? Or you want to go and, and rent some Zara or whatever. They buy from other brands, and we'll also discuss this in, in the legal considerations, uh, but they buy from other brands, they aggregate it, right? And so you have all these different brands that sit on this, um, on this platform, and then you can go and rent from multiple brands, right? So at a high level, these are the three different ways that you can interact with, with the brand. Um, today, this is kind of what the ecosystem looks like in the United States, right? And this is kind of the visualization of what I just talk, talked about, right? The third party service provider, which obviously is a lot of brands today, right? And you have department stores and actually a lot of these third party service provider brands are powered by, by Castle. Um, you have um, the, the self-operated brands, right? Like or Newly is the brand from Urban Outfitters um, in H&M. And then you have these aggregators, right? Like Run the Runway, the Toad is another one, Fashion Pass is another one. You have a lot of those in the United Kingdom as well. Um, so it's really um, a pretty broad and varied ecosystem, right? When you think about the fact that um, none of this existed 10 years ago, um, this is a, already feeling like a bit of a crowded space, right? It's not, uh, it's not a novelty anymore. And you see a lot of brands investing um, in this landscape and investing in this business model because there's, there's consumer demand. Um, so this is kind of the apparel, right? Subscription rental landscape 
um, today in the United States. There, there are more, right? I'm not capturing them all, but this is kind of to give you guys an idea of, of, of the breadth that you can already see in this market. What I think is interesting, um, a little bit as, as, as background, right, is um, that this is now giving other businesses ideas, right? And what you're seeing, what you're seeing today is that you're getting the shift from like getting access to things that are pretty commoditized, right? Clothes, um, to really other businesses jumping on this idea, right? Which is like, um, really anything can be rented, right? And anything can be rented as a subscription. And I, I think this is really the, one of the critical components of this is um, the idea of a um, continuing subscription and continuing access right, to the same commodity. And when you think about the fact that you know, today you have cars, right, car services, luxury car services like BMW, Cadillac, Porsche, right, um, that actually allow you to pay a monthly fee. Right? Just think about that. You pay a monthly fee every month to get access to any sort of cars that you want. Now, obviously, this is, you know, very expensive, right? You can have a subscription for a BMW for like $4,000 a month, which is which is crazy when you know that you can lease a car for like $200, right? So it, it clearly targets a very specific, very wealthy audience. And so the point is not so much um, that this is um, making access to the service easier. I think it's that these services are popping up, right? And that um, you're seeing a true behavioral shift, right? And a consumer shift from the idea that everything needs to be owned to the idea that not everything needs to be owned. Um, and so, um, you know, same opulence is like um, a jewelry service that you can uh, subscribe to, which is crazy, right? It's $25,000 for three months, um, obviously targeting extremely wealthy clients. But what I find pretty interesting about this is that to me, if you can afford to, um, to rent, right? Jewelry for um, what is basically $10,000 a month, you can probably afford to buy that too, right? But what it means is that the people that have the ability to buy, right, that have the financial means to buy, decide consciously that they don't want to buy. And I think this is extremely important because it, it really speaks to a shift, not only in like who is participating in the rental economy, which at first you might think, well, it's only people that can't afford to buy, right? But I think that these services really exemplify why that is not true. The fact that you can afford to buy today doesn't mean that you want to buy. And I think that this is really a dramatic shift in consumer behavior um, that, that we're seeing, particularly in the United States, but I think really something that's coming, um, that's coming globally, which is um, you know, the misconception, I think, previously that, that rental um, was kind of a, um, um, a consequence of financial constraints. I think that these, these phenomenon really prove the opposite. So where does that kind of come from, right? I think this really comes from um, the rise um, of the access economy, right? And I, I want you to kind of remember um, this concept of access, right? Which is um, there's a rise in all across the entire global economy, right? I'm sure you will be very familiar with a lot of these companies that are listed on this slide. Um, I'm, sure, um, I'm sure you've used some of them um, uh, in, in, in your life. Um, but there's this concept of, of usership-based model, right? Which are completely reshaping the consumer perception towards ownership. Um, and, and I think, you know, we all know these examples across media and entertainment and hospitality and transit. Right, um, but this is very, very much early days, right, of an evolution across the economy. Because you know what I think this shows is that what consumers want is access to the brand that they love without having to commit to a brand that they love, right? Um, and so I, I think to me this is this is kind of all you need to see when you look at that slide to understand global consumer. Uh, behavior and how they're shifting, which is, you know, one thing that I always like to think about, right, is not longer than 15 years ago, the only way that you could listen to music at home, right, is if you bought a CD, right? And I'm sure you, so some of you um, 
uh, probably remember that, right? But going to the record store and, and buying, buying a CD to listen at home, right? Um, having to buy um, a movie, right? Like you, could, you, you would go and rent movies in, 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 uh, in video stores, right? And that's not, we're not talking a hundred years ago, right? We're talking um, 20 years ago, but that's an industry that has disappeared, right? They are today in the US, you can't go anywhere to rent a movie. Like that doesn't exist anymore. Um, you can't, uh, you really need to find hard to be able to even find today physical DVDs, right? Like, I don't know, um, we can't take a poll right now, but I bet that if I ask how many of you today have a DVD player at home, the answer is probably not that many, right? Um, in the US today, um, this is a dying industry, right? Manufacturers don't make DVD players anymore because people don't buy DVDs anymore. Why that is? Because today you stream your movies, right? You rent them. You don't need to buy them. Um, that is true for movies, for music, um, for um, transportation, right? I mean, today car ownership in the U.S. is in decline because you don't have to buy a car to get around. Right? You open your phone, you ask for an Uber to come and pick you up, and you go where you need to go. Um, so this is, to me, really uh, and a very important point, right? Which is um, today there's a shift from the desire to own things to the desire to access things, to get access in a convenient manner, right? Across industries. Um, and so, you know, when you think about um, what a parent rental, where it fits, you know, it's just the next iteration of all these things that today you take for granted, right? It's like, you don't question where are you going to go and watch a movie, right? It's going to be, it's going to be on, your, on your computer, on your phone, you're going to stream it on your TV. Um, you don't think about these behaviors that existed really a short time ago, right? And so um, to me, that is really significant, not only because we're obviously seeing this with you know, Gen Z and, and um, Gen X, but even you know, my parents, my grandparents, you know, they moved on. They don't ask. They didn't, they didn't, you know, say, forget about this. We're going to keep going and, and buy CDs and, and, uh, and, um, and, and rent DVDs, right? They moved on as well. As a consumer group, that is very significant because it means that it's a shift across the population that is not age restricted. So shifting back to um, kind of subscription models, right? And what that means today. Um, Really, when you think about, and I'm gonna put all this on the slide, when you think about subscription rental, right? There's kind of a consumer and a subscription access, right? And I like to kind of divide it along four kind of categories, right? One is um, ownership versus access. And one is transactional versus ongoing. And I'll tell you kind of what I mean by that. Um, ownership versus access is pretty, um, is pretty straightforward, right? It's either you can buy something, that's ownership, or you can access it, that's rental. At the same um, level, you can either have a transactional concept or an ongoing concept. Transactional means you only get it one time, right? Ongoing means that it repeats a subscription. And you see that these four concepts can intersect when it comes to the apparel world, right? The fashion world. Um, and you have players today that play all over that spectrum. And I'll take you through what they are and what that means. But, you know, on the top left, you have kind of what I call ongoing ownership. And that's like a subscription box where you get stuff that you buy, right? And for example, you have um, a sock club, right? Which is every month, you pay $30 and you get a box of socks that you keep, right? That's ongoing ownership. Similarly, <clears throat> you can have transactional ownership, right? And that is really very simple one transaction, right? You can go, you can buy. Um, that is one time transactional. That is where most of the e commerce is today. Similarly, you can have transactional access, right? And what I mean by that is you can have a one time transaction to rent. Right? You're going to a wedding, you need a tuxedo, um, or you need an evening dress, you're going to go and you're going to rent it one time. Now, that is a value proposition to a lot of people, but there's no ongoing access. Finally, right in the top right is what I call ongoing access. And what that means is you subscribe to rent, right? Every month you can rent something different. And obviously, that's a much different value proposition 
um, than a one-time rental or than ongoing buying, right? Where you basically have to keep it. So that is really kind of the four quadrants of how you can interact in the apparel world with kind of this concept of access versus ownership, either on a one-time basis or on a recurring basis. So why, why is this happening? I think is a very important question, right? I think it's happening because the current model with which people traditionally interact with apparel is extremely limiting, right? And it's extremely limiting for all the players, right? And I'll take you through that in a little bit more detail, but obviously for you as a consumer, it's limiting. Before rental, right, before subscription, the only way that you could get to wear a sweater, right, is if you bought it. Um, and as you know, it's not always easy to undo that transaction, right? Today, um, retailers are trying to make it easier because they still want to push business, but still, you know, um, returns from brick and mortar and e-commerce um, are still lower than non-returns, right? And so overall, you're still likely to be stuck with something that you don't necessarily like or that you thought you would like, you wear, you're outside the return window and you're stuck with it, right? And so as, as a consumer, to me, that's a pretty limiting value proposition, which is, hey, the only way that I can basically interact with your brand is if I buy stuff. And you know what? I don't really want to buy it. So that's very limiting for a consumer. Obviously for the retailer, it's also very limiting. Why? And we'll go into this um, in a bit more detail because you don't really know anything about your consumer, right? Somebody buys a sweater that's a medium and you never hear from them. What do you know about that person? The only thing that you know is that they bought a medium sized sweater. You don't know if it was for them. You don't know if they liked it. You don't know if they wore it, right? And you don't know if they ever will be loyal to your brand. Very limited as a value proposition, right? For, for retailers, because that's the only way that they can interact with the consumer. The same goes for suppliers, right? The problem with a fully um, access-based, um, ownership-based model, where you basically got a manufacturer for purchases, is that you have no visibility into what works as a supplier, right? And for anybody, I don't know if any one of you is, is in the fashion space, in the retail space, but suppliers are really having a hard time because one month they might have, you know, make $10 million worth of business and the next, you know, half of that. And that's because they're absolutely susceptible to what retailers are ordering from them. And so they have no visibility into um, what they need to supply, how they need to supply it. And that's mostly from the fact that this is a really data poor world. So really the root quote cause of all this is that ownership is limiting across the supply chain. And we're really seeing, right, this, this shift from ownership to access. And I think it's really interesting to me that, you know, obviously very um, well-known and well-established consulting firms like McKinsey, right, are basically saying that it's the end of ownership, right? They're saying um, ownership is, is, is probably not going to disappear, but it's going to start playing a smaller and smaller role in consumers' interactions, right? And basically... They came out about, about a year and a half ago with um, a report that was called the end of ownership, right, across retail. Um, and really what it says is that the consumer's appetite for variety, for sustainability keeps growing and growing and growing. And their desire, right, for what is seasonal, fashionable um, is, is declining. And what they're interested in is experiences, right? They want experiences, they want access, and they want to be able to discover. And when they um, kind of um, did the survey, right, um, uh, in, in millennials, um, what they found, right, is that what was um, today, uh, what was, I think the last one that they did was three years ago, um, was half that today, a vast majority of consumers, right, say that they have appetites for new ownership models. They're saying they want to participate in this. They're saying that they want to experience both pre-owned and rental, and they find this really relevant to the way that they live, right? And to me, that is, that is a pretty striking number, right? It's almost half of the people that they surveyed said that they wanted this, right? They want to be able to do more of this. And that's not only um, in the US, that's global, right? That's the state of fashion globally. People, only 20% of the people that they surveyed said 
that they're not interested in pre-owned goods, right? And that's a really small portion. Like when you're thinking about big companies that need to build their strategy 10 years out, that's a really important number that's extremely striking to me. And this is also really pushed, right, by an overall increased awareness of sustainability, right? And I think you're all probably very familiar with all of this um, globally, right? Global warming and the way that people are actually interacting um, with the planet is top of mind, particularly for the younger generations, right? And you're starting to see, even in the fashion world, massive groups like Caring and LVMH, right, saying they're committing to fighting climate change. And why is that important? Because by 2030, right, it's predicted that the fashion industry um, the uses, uh, usage of water is going to grow by 50% to almost 120 billion, right, cubic meters of water every year. Its carbon footprint is gonna increase to almost 3,000 million tons, right? And the amount of waste that, is, that it creates is gonna hit 150 million tons. Now, those are very, very big number, right? Um, but I think what you need to take away from this is that the apparel industry, the retail industry pollutes a lot, right? It's one of the major contributors uh, after the energy sector in, in pollution, right? Um, in 2015, it generated something like a billion tons of uh, greenhouse gases, right? Which is, I think, for you to understand, more than all international flying and maritime shipping combined, right? So I think it's really interesting to put that in perspective, which is, not a lot of people associate like what you wear on your back with the pollution in the world, right? But the industry consumes 20% of the global water, right? Um, and it's like 30% of all the plastics um, in the ocean come from the retail space. So there's, there's, a, there's a reckoning, right, in the industry, which is you just can't keep going like this because the focus is on renewable energy and how consumers interact and solar power. But Really, you have this massive industry worth trillions of dollars that is polluting at levels never seen before, and they're starting to realize they need to do something about it. So all of that to say, right, and, and I think this is kind of the conclusion of, of kind of part one, which is you're seeing this arc. You're seeing this arc that is driven both by consumer appetites and recognition from um, the supply chain that something needs to change. And, and, and really, that leads to a lot of limitations and, and talking more specifically about a parent rental and subscription. Um, there are limitations, right now I talked about it. For the consumer is you have to wear clothes. Um, if you wanna wear clothes, you have to buy them, right? It limits your ability to experiment, to discover. Um, about 20% of all clothes that are bought are never worn. I think that's pretty striking, right? Like, I don't think there are many other industries where 20% of what you buy is never used, right? Maybe food uh, is another one, uh, sadly, where there's a lot of waste, right? But um, it's crazy, so much waste. Um, and what that means is that people are very limited in how they are willing to interact with buying, right? Because if you know that you have to keep it, you're not gonna make, um, you're not gonna make a lot of, um, of adventurous choices. And obviously fit, I think everybody here has bought clothes online, I'm, I'm sure. And you know that, you know, half the time you get something that you can't do anything with, right? Like I've bought so many times a t-shirt that I thought was gonna be great and you put it on and there's nothing you can do with it, right? It's just like horrible fit. And the reason is that most of the time there's no data, right? There's no way for, for retailers to know if it's gonna fit you or not. Um, and I'm sure you've all seen these kind of fit charts, right? Where it's like, oh, if you're this size and this weight by this size, it never works. For retailers, right? Um, it's very limiting because margins are terrible. And I think if, if you need to know anything about the retail world is that basically retail is in terrible shape, right? They're not making money. Um, one of the largest uh, you know, retail group in the United States, the Neiman Marcus Group, which operates like one of the largest department store network in the country, just got out of bankruptcy. Same for J. Crew, same for Brooks Brothers, right? COVID definitely accelerated that. Um, but all these businesses were in terrible financial shape right? Because at all times, they need to have super high inventory, right? They need to have a lot of clothes because they don't know what people are going to buy. And it costs them a tremendous amount of money to manufacture these clothes, ship these clothes, have these clothes in stores, pay people to sell you these clothes, 
stock this clothes in, in the stores, pay rent in their stores, and then you go and buy them, they have no money left, right? It's ter terribly inefficient business uh, where margins are terrible and retailers are realizing that they need to move to a different model, right? Um, and that really for them also means that traditional retail channels are extremely data poor, right? There's no data. You don't know anything about your, your customer. Um, you don't know anything about their habits. You don't know anything about their fit, right? And that, that is probably the most striking um, failing, right? In, in, in the retail model as, as we knew it, which is you don't know anything about who's buying from you, right? And so I think retailers are realizing that that needs to change um, as well if they want to be able to compete with, with companies like Amazon, right? Which know everything about you. They know what detergent you use. They know if you have kids at home because they know if you buy diapers, um, if you buy, you know, ba baby formula. Um, they know um, what type of food you like because you can order food online. So they know everything about your house and that gives them such an advantage in selling you clothes as well. So for, for a consumer, right, I think what the, the proposition really is, is that it allows you to um, interact, right, with the brand. It allows you to experiment and it allows you to have a choice, which I think choice is what people want um, and choice is what people are slowly getting. And to me, that's, that's really, really crucial in trying to understand the value proposition for a consumer. Because I think no model is gonna be successful if there's not a strong business proposition, right, for the consumer. I'm only gonna do this if I think there's value in it for me, right, not for the person trying to sell it to me. Um, and, and what it means for a consumer is that Having ongoing access gives you flexibility, right? It gives you the ability to say, I want to be this person this week, or I want to be another person this week. You know what? I want to try this crazy Spider-Man t-shirt because I just feel like it, right? But I don't need to buy it because I'm probably never going to wear that again because if everybody thinks I look stupid, that's, that's the end, right? Um, but then again, the ability to buy from a rental, which all of these services offer, allows you to say, hey, I'm going to try it on. Right. And if I like it, I'll buy it, but I don't have to. So really this whole um, experiential um, uh, interaction, which is like you can really immerse yourself in a brand is what really um, commerce is becoming all about and what this model is offering. Um, and really what you see for, for uh, the consumer and the consumption model, right, is that it's a blend. And I think that this is also crucial in understanding its future success is you get ownership if you want it, right? You get access if you want it, um, but you don't have to commit to anything, right? And you can stop it at any point that you want. If you're tired from a subscription, you cancel it, right? We're known as um, today that this generation, you know, Z or, or um, whatever you want to call it, is known as the cancel uh, generation, right? People cancel all the time uh, from their phone, right? You don't even need to talk to anybody, you don't need to see anybody. And, and that gives the consumer tremendous power, right? It's try something, if you don't like it, get out of it. And so I think this really changes the game across consum consumption, monetization and production, right? It gives consumers what they want on the, cons on the consumption side, right? They don't want ownership, they don't want access, they want to blend both, right? It's really, um, it's really a, a psychological shift, right, on the consumer side. Um, it really changes the game from a monetization perspective, right? It really helps solve a lot of issues around inventory management, right? And risk. You see that a lot of retailers don't know how to manage inventory because they have no way to predict, right? In the world where I'm sure you all know AI, right? Artificial intelligence is everywhere, right? Why is it everywhere? Because it allows people to predict what's gonna happen. Right? And that's really important for businesses because we all want to know what the future is going to hold because that allows us to make informed decisions, right? Think about the fact that retail has been a world when that's non-existent, right? You just don't know what's going to work. Maybe something worked this year. Maybe it won't work next year, right? And that's a crazy business proposition to basically go every cycle not knowing what's going to work, right? Really what this does what subscription uh, rental does is it gives you data, right? It gives you insights into um, what's going to work today, but also what people might want, right? Because they can give you feedback. So you understand what that means in turn is that you can manage your inventory better. 
you can manage your supply chain better. And therefore, you increase your margins, right? If you don't need to pre-commit to buying millions of dollars of clothes that you're not going to sell, um, it allows you to optimize across this arc of ownership and access, right, to monetize your inventory much better. And really, on the production side, right, touching back to what we discussed in terms of sustainability, if you know that the clothes that you're manufacturing are going to be worn over and over and over again, right, because they're going to be rented, that really puts a focus on sustainability, quality, and durability, right? If the t-shirt that you're selling is gonna be washed and washed and washed and washed and rented by everybody, you need to make sure that it's good quality. In terms, that means that you probably need to move away, right, from cheaper materials that pollute more. You need to build for the future. And that is really, um, that is really incredibly powerful, I think, as a way to change the landscape, right? And so as you think about like key benefits here in the ecosystem, right, it's really across a multiple, um, multiple different arcs, right, which is really this is attracting younger customers, right? I mean, the generation that is online, on their phone, shopping on their apps, um, and it's really, you know, this generation that has spending power online. Right? And so you're shifting away from people that might stumble in your store because they're walking in the street to people that are meaningfully and purposely engaging with your brand because they want to be there, right? They want to be part of this conversation. Obviously, that means they're spending more time engaging with the brands. That means you get more data. That means you get more insights, right? And I'm sure you know, um, you know data privacy is something that we're going to discuss as well, but um, you can follow people. Right? Once they have a cookie on your website that allows you to track them, uh, you can follow their journey online. Right? And if you see that after coming to your website to rent clothes, they're going to um, you know, Airbnb right? because they want to rent an apartment in San Francisco next week for a party, you can then start suggesting predictively things for them to rent for this occasion. Right? So you see how this loop of commerce is kind of closing. Um, that means that they can also spend more with your brand, right? If you recommend better things for them to spend, they will spend more. That's just a fact, right? Um, I'm sure you've all had, you know, these ads on your phone pop up um, because your phone heard you discuss something um, and, um, and, um, and, um, and, and kind of picked up on recommendations, right? A lot of people buy that, right? Because they understand what you want. And there's no secret. You need to be told what the consumer wants to be able to understand that. Um, and again, you know, for, for the retailer, that increases profitability because you can start predicting um, using technology. Um, and really, you know, that for, for a brand, that means more consumers, right? More spending from a consumer with your brand, unprecedented amount of data, right? That really um, was not available to this world and a better return on investment, right? Better monetization. And for the consumer, and we, we touched on this and that's kind of, um, kind of a wrap up uh, slide, but it really, it's, transform it's transformative for a consumer, right? To be able to immerse yourself in the brand, to get better economic value out of the way that you interact with the service, right? Um, and also feel like you're making smarter decisions, right? I think we all feel better if we can try something before we buy it, right? Um, just like I'm sure if you buy a car, you'd love to be able to drive it for three months, right? And some brands are moving to that because they realize that People don't want to commit before they try, right? But think about this in, in the grander um, scheme of, of the economy, which is people want to understand what they're committing to before they're committing to it. 